Good afternoon. I'm going to put this up a bit higher. Uh, right, good afternoon everybody. Um, if you can hear me at the back. Yes, the lady in the blank, you very much. Okay, so unlike Dominic and others, like Nigel, who can speak without notes, I have to speak with notes because I can barely remember who I am anymore. Um, but uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at the uh, Birmingham Wildlife Festival. My name's Will Travers. I'm the president and chief executive of the Born Free Foundation, which was started 32 years ago. I was one of the founders with my mum and dad who were in the film Born Free. Who has seen the film Born Free? Yes. Thank goodness for that. I do not now have to spend the next five minutes telling you what the film was about. The film is 50 years old this year. It had its royal premiere in 1966. So we have designated this year year of the lion um i'm not going to talk about badgers i'm not going to talk about foxes i'm going to read to you uh, a speech that is to do with trophy hunting entitled making a killing and um just so we're clear to trophy hunting is killing animals for fun it's not about killing animals for food it is about killing animals for fun and um Somebody had fun last year killing Cecil. Cecil the lion. Uh, does everyone know what Cecil the lion's story is? Yes, you do. Shocking, disgusting, dreadful, awful. So trophy hunting is a pretty hot issue. A few months ago, the French environment minister announced a ban on the import of lion trophies into France. In response to information provided by my good friends at the Bridget Bardot Foundation. After that, I attended an adjournment debate in the House of Commons with our Minister, Minister Rory Stewart, talking about trophy hunting. And what was his response? His response was, we're going to give the trophy hunting industry two years to get their act together, and then we will consider whether to take further action. It's a little bit of a lame response, in my view, when compared to the French and their reaction to trophy hunting. So, I wanted to put my remarks today into two important contexts, a couple of important contexts. The first is the growing human population across the planet. Does anybody know how many people are alive in the world today? 7.4 billion people. Does anybody know how many there'll be at the end of this century? 11 billion people. That's according to a new report out by the EU, which draws on United Nations data. And it's 80% accurate. It's the best estimate that we've got. Now, I just want to put that into context. And I'm going to use Africa as my stage here because it's the place I know best. There are only two countries in Africa that will see their population go up by less than 50% by the end of the century. They are South Africa and Djibouti. There are three countries that will see their population grow by between 50 and 100%, so double the population by the end of this century. And they are Lesotho, Botswana, and Namibia. Let me give you a snapshot of the rest. Angola will go up by 500%. Malawi, 500%. Mozambique, 400%, Kenya nearly 400%, Burundi over 550%, Zambia 800%, and in Nigeria, where 28% of girls do not complete primary education, the population is predicted to rise from 100, 174 million two years ago to 913 million by the end of the century. Overall, the population, the human population of Africa will rise from 1 billion to 4 billion in the next 80 years. So in my mind, one of the questions is not so much can we save the elephant or the lion or the rhino, but can we save anything? 
And it's not just about those raw numbers. They don't reflect the true pressure that we as humans put on natural resources. If you recall, one American child born today, and this is an average, will use 10 times the resources of a Kenyan born today. So it's not just about raw numbers, it's about resource use. My question is, will we, to our shame, be left with living museums, which is what I call zoos, populated by a tiny number of the most charismatic species, and they will be just a constant reminder of how we've destroyed the rest of life on Earth. Are we, in fact, the anthropoid equivalent of a swarm of locusts? We think we're smart, but maybe we're just the stupid cause of the sixth great extinction. So what can we do about it? Well, wildlife and people are going to come into increasing conflict as our population grows and as wild areas are put under pressure. Well, we can eliminate the problem. When wildlife and the habitats that they live in, which lock up natural resources, get in our way, we can just remove them. Okay, that's one option. The secondly, we can use what I would call a simple utilitarian approach, and that means if it gets in the way, we can trap it, poison it, shoot it, or gas it. Thirdly, we can kind of park our moral compass and we can dress up youth lethal utilization, for which read trophy hunting, as an acceptable form of management, claiming that it contributes to conservation and benefits disadvantaged communities. Trophy hunters will tell you that the money that comes from trophy hunting goes back to local communities. The research indicates that well, how many percent would you think? What, 20% goes back to communities? 30%? 40%? 3%? Someone said two and they were jolly nearly right. Three pence in the pound goes back to local communities. The fourth option, you'll be surprised to hear that I advocate the fourth option, is we try to create an environment of coexistence that seeks to balance the needs of people, that respects the requirements of non-human species, that considers that those species are made up of individual animals with individual needs and, well, and that their well-being should be taken fully into consideration. So let's just have a little look at that whole trophy hunting issue. I'm gonna give you a few more numbers. They relate mainly but not exclusively to lions. The number of African lion trophies imported into the United States in 2013 and 2014, so just a couple of years ago, 1,374. The number of lion trophies imported into the US in 2015, which is the year for which we have the latest figures and not complete, 415 just in that year alone. The number of lion trophies imported into the United States in the last 15 years, 7,300. In the same month that Cecil was shot, US hunters legally shot, the same month, US hunters shot 69 more lions. 1.2 million trophies are brought into the United States every single year. And the cost of shooting a lion, 75,000. So using that 3%, that means out of that $75,000 that the hunter pays to shoot a lion, somebody help me with the maths, $2,250, that's 3%, goes to the local community. That's a crime. The number of US registered trophy hunters are 11.6 million people. So that's, a, that's the US. Now what about Europe? What about us? Well, in the last, between 2004 and 2013, so in 10 years, the top five European countries in terms of trophy imports were Spain came first, 21,700 trophies. 
Germany, 19,000 trophies. France, 12,000 trophies. Italy, 11,000. Portugal, 8,000. So those are some of the facts. I'd like to sum it up like this. There are simply too many of us, too many of us, and too few of them. How many lions exist today in Africa? 20,000. There are 400,000 elephants. There are 25,000 rhino. There are 80,000 giraffe. There are 20,000 lions. There are 1,000 mountain gorillas. To think that we can any longer have a system which allows a wealthy, privileged, and hugely well financially resourced elite allows those people to go to parts of Africa or anywhere else in the world to kill animals for fun is abhorrent. It is an abomination and it deprives us, whether we ever go to Africa to see those animals or not, it deprives us of the knowledge that those species are protected and thriving in the wild. Compassionate conservation is a term coined by Born Free and is gaining momentum internationally. And it requires that we actually look at conservation from the individual animal's point of view. In other words, that we make sure that if we are doing conservation, we take individual animal welfare into account. We actually believe that it will deliver better conservation if we do that. And that ho opens up a whole moral and ethical dimension. So we can have an argument, a debate, you and me, anyone else, about the numbers and the statistics. We can say careful management or not very careful. We can say sustainable offtake or unsustainable. We can say benefits to communities and we can say not so much. What about the ethical dimension? You may have heard of a moral philosopher, he is on the radio a lot. His name is Professor Roger Scruton, and he describes his first hunt like this. One minute I was lost in solitary thoughts, the next I was in a world transfigured by collective energy. The energy that swept me away was neither human nor canine nor equine, but a peculiar synthesis of the three, a tribute to centuries of mutual dependence revived by this moment in ritual form. He goes on to say, in that world, by which he means the wild world, animals are not tamed or subservient creatures of the farmyard or the family house. They are our equals with whom we are in a contest that may prove as dangerous to the hunter as it is to his quarry. I have to say, that is a lot of self-serving claptrap. It's absolute nonsense. The trophy hunter, with his or her long-range, high-penetration, super-scoped rifle, or counterbalanced bow, or high-velocity crossbow, all of them able of hitting a target at hundreds of meters, there's nothing noble, or honorable, or courageous, or laudable about killing animals in that way. In fact, quite the opposite. Those who take delight in taking life are the psychopaths who drive the rest of us deprive the rest of us of nature's beauty. They undermine respect. They are all about ego. They are people with more money than sense, determined to satisfy that ego. As one hunter put it, hunting keeps me real. I would say, get real. I'm gonna finish with a true story and not about hunting for a moment, but just to give you a sense of how out of touch some parts of the world are with what I think the majority feel. I went to a massive conference in South Africa three years ago, the CITES conference, Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. It wasn't in South Africa, I'm sorry, it was in Thailand. The one that's coming up is in South Africa. And at that conference, I was invited to a meeting organized by the South African Environment Minister. She's still the Environment Minister. Her name's Edna Malewa. And this was billed as an opportunity for her to listen to the views of the wider community. And this was all about whether to legalize rhino horn in international trade. Rhino, one of the world's most endangered species that, by the way, can still be hunted 
for fun. She said, I'm testing the water of public opinion. It was not a test that I relished because for 90 minutes, the audience was bombarded with facts and figures from hunters, economists, rhino owners, diplomats, politicians. We felt brutalized. And then the minister said, does anybody have any questions? Now, I'm a very shy, retiring, wallflower of a guy. So I timidly raised my hand, not. And I said, Minister, I have some fundamental concerns with what you've set out here. But then I looked at the nine experts that she'd put up on the stage, and I said, I have just one question for you. Do you believe it works? In other words, do you think rhino horn works? I said, don't be shy. Raise your hand if you believe that rhino horn works. And nobody moved a muscle. There was a moment's silence that seemed to last for ages. And my question hung in the air. And then somewhat sheepishly, the panel admitted that they did not believe that rhino horn works. And for me, that reveals a shocking degree, the sort of cynical exploitation that runs through the whole wildlife trade industry. Here's what I imagine. I imagine a Chinese or a Vietnamese family a few years from now, their elderly mother is dying of cancer, the children hearing that rhino horn is a cure, they scrape together their last resources and they buy some. It would be legal were rhino horn to be legal. It would be exorbitantly expensive and it would be useless. And so their mother dies. They are now in poverty. Their mother has gone and their tragic circumstances are as a direct result of the blatant exploitation of their vulnerability, ignorance and superstition by those who know better but are in the business of making money. I was deeply distressed by that experience and I still am. So, in conclusion, just because we can does not mean we should. Just because it's legal does not make it right. There are too many of us and too few of them, whoever you want to describe the them as, African elephants, rhino, lions, for us any longer to create economic or social arguments to justify what is simply unjustifiable. It is time for our species to change. It is time for us to reject the killing of wild animals for fun. And it's time to turn from being human beings into humane beings. Thank you very much.